Namibia, a mysterious country with grandiose landscapes untouched by humans. Situated at an altitude of 1,700 meters is the capital, Windhoek. This building in the city center hides a national treasure, tens of thousands of diamonds, the most beautiful and most expensive on the planet. We were given exceptional permission to enter this highly guarded place. In this room, there are diamonds worth hundreds of millions of euros. Hey, good afternoon, guys. So, Perez, what do we have here? Paulus Chituna is the director of operations of the National Diamond Company. And these were what, first quality? Second, yeah. third, fourth? Are we checking the quality? He's the one who evaluates the value of the rough stones before they're put on the market. The whiter and purer the stones, the more expensive they are. A stone like that might, might in rough, it might be, let's say, 20,000 US dollars. Okay. But when it's polished, you probably have to add another 30 to 40 pieces. You might have to pay 40,000 for, for a stone like that, yeah. 1,000 top quality diamonds, a commercial value of almost 29 million euros. You can count them, but it will take you forever. <laughs> so we weigh them at the end of the day. So we don't leave this building until we have uh, what we call, we, are, we, have, we have reconciled. These diamonds are of unequaled purity as they come from a unique ore vein located at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. This mine boat sucks them up from a depth of 150 meters, a real technological feat. It's owned by the Namibian government and the multinational corporation, De Beers. For security reasons, the operations are fully automated and the stones are sealed in tamper-proof containers. Every year, 400 kilograms of diamonds land on this table. But the most exceptional ones are kept separately. Wow! And this is the biggest stone that we have on this. This is a brilliant, nice color. This stone, as you can see, looks pink. It's a very rare color. So we're talking a lot of money on this stone. I mean, they for say a rough estimate on this? This one? Three, uh, around about three million US dollars for this stone. This is painful. <laughs> when I look at this crack, it's very painful. <laughs> it is. Why? <laughs> it hurts. Because yeah. you would have made more money. Yeah. Me and you cannot afford this. <laughs> it's only the shakes are the guys who have oil and a lot of money that, um, that can buy a stone like that. Because when it gets, goes on auction, even if you go into the prices, they go for serious money. Once cut, these diamonds will be found in the most prestigious jewellery shops. But very few Namibians benefit from this wealth. Namibia is ranked the third most inegalitarian country in the world. Namibia, located in southern Africa, northwest of South Africa. This country with only three million inhabitants is bigger than any in Europe. Yet, many of its citizens have nowhere to live. We are moving from this place because the land is taken away from us. As a former German colony, descendants of colonizers now own almost all of the land. This is my country. I am an African. It's part of my wife's. These are the consequences of the first genocide of the 20th century. We knew. That is a killer that killed our people. Everywhere, people were starting to protest. The German must pay us. They have to pay the price. Amanda! Amanda! Yeah. After being placed under the protectorate of South Africa, it was the last country on the continent to become independent in 1990. However, its natural resources are still coveted by foreign powers. don't even know if Namibia belongs to Namibia, it belongs to China. 
countries like North Korea do business here. $29 million transferred from Namibia to Pyongyang. With profit in mind, a new crime has emerged, and the French are helping to fight against it. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Un rhinoceros a plus de valeur mort que vivant. Explore Namibia, the new far west of Africa. <laughs> At the border of the desert, on the Atlantic coast, is the city of Swakopmund. It looks nothing like an ordinary African city. Neo-Baroque buildings with imposing architecture. German street names. And spiked helmets. It's like a little Germany in Africa. They are all from the old German style, so um, from the old buildings in town, they try and keep the style similar so that it creates a nice, equal vibe in town. Sylvia Kleinstuber is of German origin. Her family has been here for four generations. Germany colonized the country from 1884 to 1915. Today, Sylvia runs the most renowned cafe in town, famous for its German pastry specialities. And then our uh, apple strudel is one of our best sellers. Here, everyone speaks German, even the African employees. Okay, we're going to get the Yeah. You mm -hmm. speak German? Ein bisschen. Yeah. <laughs> How did you learn? I learned it through the customers. Every day you have to learn something new, new word. In the kitchen, Sylvia's younger sister, Desiree, prepares the classic German cake, the famous Black Forest Gatto. It's a recipe passed down from their grandfather, a pastry chef who arrived in Swakopmund in 1954. He came from Germany here after the war. He didn't want to stay anymore. And they had family here already, just for trying it out. And there's the Black Forest. So I'm going to give that to the front. Today, 30,000 German descendants live in Namibia. The first of the family to be born here is Heidi, the mother. And she wouldn't change her German way of life for anything in the world. I think we are very fortunate to live in Namibia. We've got lots of quality, life quality, to be free. You, you, you won't feel to live in... Uh, no, 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 uh, no, never, yeah. Never? <laughs> no. You look like... After a few weeks in Germany, um, it gets too green for me. I look for my browns, uh -huh. desert browns, yeah. Her love for the desert passed down to her daughter, Sylvia. Every day she goes for a long gallop across the giant dunes of Swakopmund. It was in this peaceful looking town that the darkest events in the country's history took place. A few meters next to the dunes are hundreds of makeshift graves. This is where the German Second Reich built a concentration camp during the colonial war. Between 1904 and 1908, the army massacred 80% of the Herero ethnic minority. It was the first genocide of the 20th century. Every year on the main street of Swakopmund, a unique parade takes place. The Herero people commemorate the liberation of the city's concentration camp. They are dressed in German army uniforms. When we killed the German soldiers, we took over their, their, their attire, we took over their, their uniform and we said, these are ours now from now on. Kavita Marama, a professor of engineering, traveled 500 kilometers to be there. His grandmother was imprisoned in the concentration camp when she was just nine years old. Herero civilians, men, women and children were enslaved and starved. 
at least 60,000 of them were massacred. The order to exterminate them was given by General von Trotter, who said, any Herero discovered within the boundaries of German territory, armed or unarmed, will be shot. That includes women or children. After more than a century, in May 2021, the German foreign minister made a historic announcement. We bezeichnen heute these Ereignisse jetzt auch offiziell als das, was sie gewesen sind, ein Völkermord. Wir bekennen uns damit auch zu unserer historischen Verantwortung. Germany also pledged more than a billion euros in development programs. But the Herero people were not invited to the table. The Germans should stop for our people, for us to do They must give our land back. They must pay. They must pay. They, must pay. Well, yeah. They have to pay the price. Yeah. <laughs> They're fighting to retake the land confiscated during the German colonization. This morning, Kavita is accompanied by Jari Checa, an activist who is fighting for his land and who is not shy of going into battle. We are warriors, we are soldiers in fact. So whatever you do, what, how, whatever dealings you want to do with us, you must know that you are dealing with a, a, a tribe that is so proud of itself. They travel to a farm owned by German descendants. When you look at uh, both sides of the road, ne, from where we started, this is still a single unit. That's covering over 60,000 hectares. So 60,000 hectares, you are talking about the size of Berlin. Owned, owned by one person. This is a place of worship. It's where the first battle between the Germans and the Herero took place. Their ancestors who died on that day are buried here. We believe our people don't die. They are somewhere, they are alive, they can hear, they can talk, they can solve our problems. This land that was stolen from them is a symbol. In order to access the graves, they have to get permission from the owners of the land. Where is the bus? It's the Diekmann family. Are you filming me? Could you please stop the camera on our yeah. private ground? We want to go to the graves. Uh, uh, what graves? Uh, our ancestors' graves. Your why, ancestors why, why are you saying what graves? There's not a single ancestor grave. We've this only got German graves here. We know, we know where it is. We know where we are going. Mm. It's just that it's in your farm. You must make an appointment before the time. Is it? Then we take you with our car. Mm -hmm. Cost 500 rand per person. Mm -hmm. We can make you a special price. Mm -hmm. And uh, when does it suit you? You wanted to go now. No, mm. it's not possible now. This is lunchtime now. Adjusting yeah. the contacts. Okay. <laughs> you can see that person. He's, he's giving us a middle finger. These are uh, arrogance of words that the constitution protects them. It means it's a private property. Luckily, I was, not, I was with you guys, or I was with him. I could have caused havoc there. During the colonization, many Herero people fled to neighboring countries, while others remained here in their native region. Without land, they were forced to settle illegally away from the villages. The town hall just evicted Kavita from the land he had occupied with his family since 1924. He only had this fence to take with him. We are moving from this place because the land is taken away from us. We have no land anymore here, so we must go find another piece of land. 
Now we are here struggling without land in our own country, Namibia. Okay. A last coffee with his neighbors. They too are forced to leave. I feel bad. Because I don't know where we now grow up and then I don't know where we are going to. This was Kavita's family home. It's the only, any, the only house I know since birth. I grew up in this house. I grew up in this house. I went to school from this house. I love it very much. Now for me to, to leave it and go, it's not easy. Kavita found a new plot of land about 20 kilometers away. He decided to settle there once again without permission. A nomadic life which was not about to change. In 2022, an article in the Namibian, the country's most popular daily newspaper, caused a scandal. Harry Schneider Waterberg, a major landowner and a descendant of the settlers, refused to acknowledge the confiscation of the Herero land. The German settlers did not steal any land. That irresponsible uh, uh, idiot, uh, Schneider, that very provocative person, he is treating us the very same way his ancestors treated our ancestors. We are going to act and we are going to rebel. Do you think you could forgive them? Not oh. now. When you, when you see a white person, that trauma is coming back. He knew that is a killer that killed our people. It's on the Waterberg Plateau, where the man behind the scandal owns a huge farm of 400 square kilometers. Harry Schneider Waterberg is comfortably settled here with his wife, Sonja. Wird sich ja irgendwo wieder Rinderarbeit haben, aber ich muss auch mal wieder ins Büro. Leider. How come do you have the same name of the plateau? <laughs> that was the idea of my grandfather's to add the, the name of the of the of the mountain to his surname. It had to be approved by Parliament, so imagine that. I mean, you know, his grandfather is this young soldier. He came to the country in 1908 to serve in the army. He liked the adventurous lifestyle and started a family. In the course of time, he bought a total of 18 Herero farms from the German administration and started breeding cows. Moro. Oh. Harry now manages a team of about 40 employees. Most of them are Herero. Every morning he reviews what happened the previous night with his right hand man. He has a herd of 1,400 cows spread across his land. He breeds them for their meat and is one of the biggest beef producers in the country. Every day he spends hours in his car watching over the animals. It's a huge piece of land. It is massive. To manage it in such a way that it uh, that it's effective uh, is a lot of work, absolutely. Recently, he started breeding Anglo-Arabian racehorses. Look there, the horses will come, are coming in. 102 precious livestock, which he has to protect from predators. Our whole management on, on this farm uh, is adapted to the fact that we have leopards here. 
We have a lot of leopards here. Leopard is an everyday reality for us. In two months, he had already lost three horses. I'm very connected to their land, you know, emotionally. And this farm has given me a, a, a wonderful life. Oscar. In Namibia, Caucasians represent 6% of the population, but they own 70% of the farmland. German are accused to have stolen the land. That is not only in Namibia, so that was in, in, in all colonies as such. That's the story of, of Australia and the Americas. And, and after, the, after in our Namibia independent in 1990, the government of the day asked landowner to have a more fair distribution of, of, of land. And uh, my, my, my father at the time actually sold uh, some 27% of his land. So owning, owning land is not really, uh, doesn't, make you, doesn't make you rich. It, uh, it, it's uh, working the land successfully that can make you some money. According to our estimations, 40,000 hectares of land are worth more than 6 million euros. This semi-desert country has another very important resource, water, and an abundance of it. An ideal environment for the cows to grow. Mandaka, one of his Herero employees, takes care of them. He's an absolute uh, hermit. He lives out here completely on his own. Look at his pants. <laughs> He's eccentric. <laughs> He's with me now for 34 years. Harry assumes his heritage with confidence. According to him, colonization is not all bad. It's a very important part of the development of, 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 the, of, the, of the country in Namibia, which was at that stage called Southwest Africa. And I mean, you know, and before that it was, it didn't even have a name. I mean, you know, from, or European name. I mean, you know, so it was sort of this dark, uh, dark Africa at the time. And then some first uh, the, the explorers came in and the development of the country. And I think we've got to appreciate it. Like every, every nation needs to appreciate the history. German settlers were the first to extract diamonds from Namibian soil. When Germany lost the First World War, Namibia became a South African protectorate. And the multinational corporation De Beers got its hands on the mines. The company has dominated the diamond market for over a century. Today, only in Namibia, it has an average turnover of almost 1 billion euros per year. But Namibian citizens have to make do with much less precious stones. In the west of the country, the Namib Desert. It's the oldest desert in the world, a hostile environment inhabited by stone hunters. Hello, Marisa, Marisa. Okay. In Bandu's family, everyone from father to son is a miner. He has always been associated with Osis. It's like my brother because we are growing up together here at the farm. For the past 20 years, they've been meeting here twice a month to explore this immense area that barely offers them enough to survive. Okay. Okay. Precious minerals are outcropping on the ground. This black tourmaline is that one. Yeah. They're used for small jewelry or for their therapeutic properties. See this one, it's Amazonite. Can you find any diamonds? No, no diamonds around. <laughs> no diamonds around. If there was diamonds, maybe those years oh, we was already rich. 
They still hope to find a stone that will allow them to have a better life. They dig for hours in this granite rock. He's making a small hole. Yeah, that one is uh, how we are follow the reef. Ne? Then, you can, then you can get a pocket of something like that. Nice pieces. Smoky crystal, Roy. Uh, uh, I'm yeah. looking for big pieces. Nice, nice big pieces. What I can sell. Maybe big like my hand. They won't leave the desert until they find their happiness. A week later, in this little cafe, Mbandu is the center of attention. He's proud to show his little treasures, Amazonite stones, before going to sell them. Can I touch? Uh, not that, but look, only look. Uh, I think it's wet, but it's dry. What do you think? Is it nice? Or? It's nice, but we don't know. Oh, it's a man. <laughs> He wanted to get $250 for them, just enough to live on until his next trip to the desert. To sell them quickly, he headed for Mike's souvenir shop. Good morning. Good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, I have some pieces of stone. OK, let's have a look, see what you got. OK. Who cleaned them? And me, self. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lovely colour. Yeah, it's a nice colour. This is not so cool yeah. for us at the moment. Okay. What with all the COVID and no tourists, not too interesting That's... at the moment. Mbandu is one of the last independent miners in Namibia. He lives in poverty, like 30% of his colleagues. In the land of diamonds, this is a situation that people find scandalous and infuriating. On the outskirts of Wintook, the shanty town of Katutura, a word that means the place where one doesn't want to live. Here, the inhabitants survive on less than one euro a day. In the market, wearing a red beret, this 31-year-old man is a local star. How are you? Fine, how are you, mommy? Hi. Can I take a picture? Not a problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Amushalelo is the charismatic leader of a small political party opposed to the government. He grew up in this slum. Tate, all good, man. He wants to inspire locals to rebel against their fate. Yet, Namibia is the third richest country in Africa. Take a look for yourself. Does this look like it's a rich country to you? The money in this country is only in the concentration of a few hands but majority of our people still continue to languish in poverty. It's in the hands of who? It's in the hands of the white people and a few elite blacks. According to him, Swapo, the party that's been in power for 32 years, is full of corruption. Ah, Resta, what's that, Commander? That's the ground fighters, man. Banyar joined the movement. This Namibian Che Guevara travels in a luxury sedan. According to him, he made his fortune in cryptocurrencies. He campaigns for his country to get rid of foreign powers that exploit Namibian workers. Uh, the construction industry has been entirely taken over by the Chinese. So the Chinese have taken over a majority of the contracts in this country. Like the construction of this new highway that leads to the airport. If the rain comes, then it washes this road away like there was nothing. Another serious problem is that the company has allegedly been manipulating the wages of its Namibian workers. They called Michael to the rescue. Amanda! 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 
they all went on strike. You people have the power. You must learn to stand up and fight for yourself. Every month, the company deducts 10% of their salary to pay social security contributions. But since 2019, this money has never been paid back to the state. Now it is clear that the Swapo government and the Chinese are busy stealing from all of us. Government is always going after small businesses, Namibian-owned companies, forcing them to pay tax. But their Chinese friends, they are busy protecting them. They must refund you all that money and then you receive tax exemptions. So tell Mr. Wu, Mr. Yi, Mr. Ha Yi that they are going to pack up their bags because we don't want thieves in this country. Without any official authority, Michael is going to demand accountability from the executives. You're in charge? The English is a little poor. It's okay. My, my Chinese is also a little bit poor. Cornered, they agree to negotiate with him. No, the media, it has to be transparent. What we have to talk, it has to be on the record. Why are you deducting tax from the workers, but you're not paying it over to the government? I get the point. We agreed that we're going to refund, but we're going to refund, but it will be deducted when the tax... No, you as the company are going to pay that tax that is due to government. But the money of the workers, you are going to give it back to the workers. That money is for their holiday. That is what's going to happen. No. That's it. By Wednesday, the workers are going to report to me. If they have not been paid, then I'll make sure all of you will sit in jail on Thursday. And it's going to be for a very long time. OK, let's see. OK. Wednesday, make sure the people are paid. Failure yeah. for them to pay. We get one of the tires, we get diesel, and we deal with him. Yeah. 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 For far too long, Namibia has been known to be a peaceful country. Sometimes you need to use violence in order for you to send a message. And the message is to say that stop exploiting Namibians. If you continue exploiting Namibians, then we'll fight fire with fire. Surprisingly, the executives paid the workers back before the end of the ultimatum imposed by Michael. Amanda! The next day, they confronted small Chinese traders in Chinatown. So this thing's fake. We take, understand? This is not real Havianas. Fake Havianas. Yeah. Tell the Chinese all the shops are closing. As a result of this new operation, he was arrested for inciting violence. He's now in prison awaiting trial. China is Swapo's historical ally. They supported this political party at the time of independence. In Windhoek, China builds most of the official buildings, like the new Swapo headquarters or the recent Ministry of Home Affairs. It has also taken over the country's most strategic resource, its uranium mines. Namibia is the fourth largest producer of uranium in the world. One man investigated Chinese activities in his country. His whereabouts must remain secret. He is constantly under threat. I'm definitely under surveillance, without any doubt. And I've been beaten up, um, you know, put into hospital, you know, previous occasion. Um, I have to take some basic precautions at all times. I do not advertise uh, when I'm going away or where I'm going to. John Grobler is not just anyone. He's the country's most award-winning investigative journalist. He found evidence that another country is using China as a cover to build official buildings. Oh, I found this file. Because in here, you have you know, the original documentation, all the invoices you know, on you know, the construction of state house. 
the heart of Namibian power. I mean, here you can see $29 million transferred from Namibia to Pyongyang. The UN forbids certain business deals with the capital of North Korea under the threat of being sanctioned. So when the affair broke out, workers of the North Korean construction company left within 24 hours. John was the first to arrive. There was some sort of a panic, you know, and they ran. I mean, they literally left their food standing on the table like that. Through constructions like the Presidential Palace, the UN fears that Namibia is indirectly financing the North Korean nuclear program. North Korea also benefited from other public contracts, such as the construction of the Independence Museum. On the pedestal stands a national hero and a former president, Sam Najuoma. This looks like it's you know, cast out of bronze, but it is in fact uh, it's kind of a plastic, it's like a polymer that they just spray paint. You can see the cracks appearing everywhere. Uh, this is all fake stick-on stuff. It's not real, uh, it's a facade. A fake museum with half-finished communist-inspired frescoes. What is that supposed to be? Yeah? Because there's a lot of contextualization around it that is missing. Another reason why Namibia attracts so much attention from Asia is because of its priceless natural riches. Wide open spaces as far as the eye can see, with little human presence. Only three inhabitants per square kilometer, the second lowest population density in the world. A paradise for many wild animals. But a living hell for an endangered species of rhinoceros. Namibia's largest rhino reserve is located in the north. Hey, girls! Come, boys, come! Juliet has been working here as a carer for eight years. Good boys, find it. Find it. Good boys. There are 150 of them, and each one has a name. Come, MP. Come, Luca. come. They know their names, and they know um, a few, few things like stay um, back, Wait, find it, uh-uh, back, uh-uh, and pee back. Calm down. Come, hey, hey, come. Sorry, I thought they were following me. <laughs> Naughty boys. <laughs> you could see they're very curious. They wanted to come to you to see what you were up to, what you were doing. And that's one of the problems with poaching. Yeah. So they're very easy target. Three rhinos are killed every day in the world. Their horns are sold at a premium in Asia. To protect them from poachers, the reserve called a French NGO, the only one of its kind. If you are static, you're dead. Move. They Let's use protect. paramilitary yes. methods. We are not Jean-Claude Van Damme or Bruce Lee. I don't want to see that, for example. No. That's for the movie. OK. Now in his 60s, Sergio oh, Lopez like has had a career in the army and in private security. Yeah. Mm. Today, he trains the anti-poaching unit of the reserve, which is in great need of it. What are you doing? You are laughing. Yes, why not? But it's not a problem to laugh. It's a problem, OK, to work. Jab, jab, yes, hook, hook. On voit quand même que la, la quasi-totalité, donc n'ont aucune base, euh, même pour les coups de. Bon, je pensais faire des choses ce matin, donc là je je fais plus que light. Ce qui est un petit peu gênant, c'est qu'on sent que le combat ne fait pas partie naturellement de leur, je dirais pas de leur quotidien, mais euh, bon, il y, y, y a du travail. With his NGO Wildlife Angel. Sergio travels around Africa and tries to give rangers the means to fight against highly organized enemies. The Asian Mafia is at the head of the rhino horn trade. Quick, 
quick, quick. All the team, we are shot. Hey, what are you doing here? Come here. You are going to war alone. Come quick, quick, quick. Medical assistance requested. They prepare for real life scenarios. This simulation exercise allows Sergio to evaluate reactions of the Rangers in a crisis situation. On average, 150 Rangers are killed every year worldwide. He's bleeding a lot. The Frenchman takes his role seriously. Uh, uh, come on, come on, come on, come on. And the Rangers are not up to the task. How many are you? Seven. 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 So how many people must go in the bush to save the, your friends? Seven. 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 And uh, with how many people did you go? Six. Six. Ah, why? That's my fault. I was, I thought we were going to. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yes, All your sir. team was ready, you were not ready. And that's a big, big, big mistake. Do you think Porto's gonna say to you, hey guys, we're gonna shoot in three, four minutes, get ready. No, they will shoot by night, guys. They will shoot by night and you will all be in chaos like this. That's why we train. C'est euh, la guerre euh, de, notre, euh, de notre génération, de notre siècle. On est en train de parler de, de la survie de, 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 de centaines d'espèces qui sont en train de disparaître au fur et à mesure. Rien que sur une seule réserve, j'ai appris euh, il y a moins d'une semaine qu'il y a 94 rhinocéros qui ont été abattus sur une réserve en Afrique du Sud. J'imagine pas un monde sans, sans animaux sauvages, sans... Voilà, c'est un petit brin de magie qui reste sur cette terre et, euh, et on est en train de, de, de la détruire complètement. When he's not on a mission, back in France, Arthur Berthaud is a beekeeper. He's been involved with the NGO since its creation in 2014. It was Sergio who taught him everything. They're still facing a major problem, the lack of resources. Ah donc c'est encrassé complètement. Ça arrive assez souvent, deux trois fois par jour. Vehicles in the reserve are about 50 years old and have traveled countless kilometers. Shoot as you want. When it comes to weapons. Problem the extractor. Okay, so take your magazine off. Incident de tir. Okay. They jam often, and there's a reason for it. Ouais, sans quand même pas de dernière jeunesse. 53 munitions des pays de l'Est, très très mauvais état. Moi, j'ai jamais vu ça. Une munition aussi tordue, c'est quand même incroyable. Ça veut dire que le jour où il y a un échange de tirs sévère, il est possible que plus aucun Rangers ne puisse réagir après deux trois tirs. Et ça, c'est le quotidien quoi. des équipes anti-braconnage. A dangerous job that has to be done seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and pays a miserable salary of 100 euros a month. You can maybe do a lot of work more than expected, it's being a ranger, doing some extra work. What's the difference between the salary of a ranger and the price of the rhino home? <laughs> no, <laughs> the difference. <laughs> The difference is uh, maybe negative zero <laughs> from the rhino horn to the, to the ranger salary. On the black market, horns sell for at least 61,000 euros a kilogram, which is more than gold. Chinese medicine attributes therapeutic properties to it, which have never been scientifically proven. To discourage poachers, the reserve found a radical method. After giving the animal anesthetics, the vet cuts off its horn. A delicate but painless operation. Just like nails, the horns are made of keratin. Hi, Sergio. How are you? No problem with you? Jaco Muller, the owner of the reserve, brought in Sergio's NGO. Okay. His help so was free. You so you you happy with their progress? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yako doesn't get any help from the government to protect his animals. Their horns could easily cover the expenses to save the species. We met up with him in town 
in a place he wants to keep secret. He hides his treasures here. In the black market, this one will be worth roughly 450,000 US dollars. For us, it's, it's now actually dangerous to have it. People will come kill me, they will come to my house to kill me for these things. Over time, he's collected dozens and dozens of them. He hopes that one day their sale will be legalized. The moment there's a larger supply to the market, the price will drop. If I can get um, 6,000 US dollar per kilogram, it can help me to save the species from extinction. Legalization would also allow him to become a millionaire. Since 2019, the animals of Namibia have been facing an even greater danger. It claims tens of thousands of lives every year. Drought, a direct consequence of global warming. The weather in this country has become unbearable. It's the hottest in southern Africa, leaving the animals with no more food to eat. In a remote region of the northwest lives an old tribe. Its people have been particularly exposed to the consequences of the drought. They are the Himba. A tribe with an ancestral way of life, they settled in the region in the 15th century. Kasoto, the village chief, is very worried. He's lost half his cows, the only resource his people have. Women are affected by this lack of milk for another surprising reason. It's used to prepare okra, an ointment made from milk fat. That morning, Bendura was in charge of preparing it. The elders watched her preparation method closely. The okra is what gives them their red colour, a way for Himba women to seduce their partners. <laughs> But with the milk shortage, it's impossible to make enough okra for all the women. No other solution than to organize an expedition to the city. Their goal was to find butter to replace the milk. Bendura led the little group, hitching a ride. <laughs> For her two cousins, this trip was special. It was their first time outside the village. After two hours on the road, they were dropped off for a trip to an unknown land, the supermarket. They came to buy butter and couldn't resist the temptations.
They had never seen chips, but they knew the packaging of the butter to buy. Men in the village had given them the little money they earned from selling goats. Bendura and her cousins had never been part of the consumer society. They started by tasting a sausage patty. Do you like it? As for the chips and cola menu, it seemed to be a hit, even with the himba. This young nation with exceptional wealth could largely provide for the needs of its people, on the condition that the foreign powers put an end to controlling its resources.